my learned colleague just talked about innovation. How are we going to innovate? What are we going to do? Well, I'm going to show you. Right now, I'm solving the innovation issue. You ready? You're going to help me too. If you're blogging and tweeting and blah, 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 don't. I love that blah, 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 by the way. All right, you ready? Touch your eyes. I'm watching. Excellent. Keep going. Touch your nose. Very good. Touch your mouth. Awesome. Put your hands down. Amazing. You know what you just did? You identified how we sometimes stop innovating in the workplace. And do you know who I have the great pleasure of telling you about? Who I learned this from? A man who is so unlike me it hurts. Napoleon. See how tall I am? He was very short. Napoleon dealt with change the best we've ever seen. He took scholars everywhere he went. Napoleon was brilliant. I mean, as a strategist, he did well. As a, a warmonger, I don't know what you want to call him. He really did a good job for France for a while. He did well. But he learned to adapt to change by helping people see what was different, hear and smell what was different. I didn't ask your hands. And he learned to speak differently. He learned to adapt to the culture he was in so he could move it forward. And that's where all my research starts. My research starts with moving you forward. My job is to make your life easier. And if I can help you do that today, I will. But the only way I can do that was with data, 100% data. So my re most recent study, and yes, my visual aids are on the floor, is and was on generational communication. You see, what I learned from Napoleon is that you have to shift to be able to communicate with someone. And that allows you to innovate. And right now, we're not shifting at all, ever. You said blah, blah, blah. I love blah, blah, blah. How many people actually pay attention to you in a meeting? The number is three. If you're in a room with 10 people, three might be listening. That's amazing. Three. How much innovation do you think is going to come from that? I can tell you, not much. We're in the least innovative time we've ever been. Think about it. Outside of the internet, what's good? Really, I mean nothing. We haven't, but we are still driving cars the same way my parents drove cars. We're still talking on the phone. I mean, we don't have a cord on our phone, but we're still talking on the phone. What have we done? Now, let's look at CEOs. And for those of you who are CEOs in the room, I apologize a little. Um, what great CEO, what great leader have we produced in the last 20 years that hasn't gone to jail? That's an amazing statistic right there. And last but not least, what have we done to help people and sustain our leadership? Well, nothing, because I hear every day, oh my god, those millennials, won't they just work? Why are they traveling? Why are they doing this? Why aren't they staying? Blah, blah, blah. And from the millennials, I hear, oh my gosh, my boss is so old. And I'm, I ask, could you please define old? Because as an academic, we want to know what old is. <sighs> They just want to talk about PowerPoint and sit in a meeting and do this and do that. So I talked to over 6,500 people last year. That's a lot of people. And from those people, we took a survey of 1,000 people. And we had a response rate of 20%. That's an amazing response rate. We had a confidence level of 90% and a margin of error of 5%. And it was all about Napoleon. Because I was asking people, how do you deal with different generations? What stops you from being productive at work? And it's that they're not listening to each other. And do you know who predicted this? Marshall McLuhan. How many of you know about Marshall McLuhan? Oh, such a great audience. Marshall McLuhan was brilliant. He could read 10,000 words a minute and retain that information. Someone from Evelyn Wood Speed Reading actually went into his classroom and measured that. Marshall McLuhan believed that with every technological advance, we would have what we call an extension. And then we would have an amputation. And if we talk about the internet and all of these great computers being designed in the 60s, 
we see that we have this great extension of knowledge. We are doing so many brilliant things because of the communication we can do. We're saving lives across the world because two doctors can talk to each other. But you know what the extension is? Or the amputation is? Listening. When was the last time you actually felt listened to anywhere? And listening is one of the sexiest things on the planet. <laughs> Let's talk, like, I mean, think about it. When you met that special someone, you know, there's a lot of things you want to do with them. One, two, probably. But one of the things that draws you to them is that they listen to you. For those of you who are old enough to remember, you used to talk to them on the phone. You couldn't wait to talk to them. Did anybody feel like that? A little nod would be good. This, I'm a teacher, remember? I need class participation. Right. We're not doing that to each other anymore. So the first thing I designed in my research, this is what we call our Rosetta Stone, just like Napoleon. Napoleon found the Rosetta Stone. How many of you remember this story? Napoleon was going along conquering. He took the academics I talked about earlier, and they found this rock. And on this rock had Latin, Greek, and Egyptian. Well, no one knew what Egyptian was. And so they broke it down, and they said, huh, this is pretty interesting. Now we can understand Egyptian. And guess what? Egyptology was born. Well, on this chart, what I identified was what stops us from listening to our leaders. What stops each generation at work from listening? So let me go through it. At the top, it says boomers, Gen X, and millennials. And we define the generations by the relationship with technology. A boomer's relationship with technology is an audiophile. They were born into radio and became accustomed to television. They process information through their auditory capacity. They process technology in a very visual way. A Gen X, born 1960 to 1980. They were born into television and adapted to computers. But when they adopted to the computer, they adopted to the individual use of the computer. PowerPoint, Word, Excel. Some people even remember putting a disk in a computer. It happened, true. Yeah, see, I'm glad some people's as old as I am here. And last but not least, and I can talk about Gen Z, but I don't have time because you know I breathe in 15 minutes. This kills me. Um, when we look at millennials, they were born into the individual computer, and they moved into the sharing economy. So they took the singular of computers and moved it into sharing. And so what we start to see and what this chart identifies is that there are dramatic differences on how each cohort is perceiving information from their leaders at work. A boomer wants to perceive information in terms of an auditory capacity. They want to talk and talk and talk. A Gen X wants to create a deck. They want to think about it. They might want to brainstorm. They'll want to write, write it on a whiteboard. Millennials in the room, if you have a Gen X boss, and they're upsetting you, say, I'm going to go work on a deck. I'll be right back. <laughs> oh, OK. That'll be good. Thank you. Gen X, if you have a boomer and they're really frustrating you, do you know what you do? Let's talk about that. I'd appreciate your opinion. And they will. And finally, we have our brilliant millennials. And you know who knows how to deal with them the best? You're never going to believe this. Bill Gates. <laughs> yep. And do you know why? Bill Gates was challenged by a police officer here in Toronto. This happened when I was still on television. He wrote to Mr. Gates and he said, Mr. Gates, you're supposed to be bright and brilliant and have these great team of people, but I'd like to ask you something. Why can't your people come up with something that can help us stop predators that are haunting children on Facebook and, and hurting them? And he came on my show, and he said, Mr. Gates actually answered me. And do you know what Mr. Gates did? Millennials love to play with technology. They love to share. He must have read some of the same research that I was working on at the time. It's Strauss and Howe, if you're interested in it. They're brilliant. And he took 40 of his brightest millennials and said, you know what? I'm going to pay you for two weeks. You go solve this problem. And they did. 
And guess what? To this day, whenever you hear about a predator anywhere in the world that's caught online, Bill Gates did that because he let millennials play. And then subsequently what they did is they gave everybody 40 hours a year to go and play and to do cool things. So this chart gives you kinds of an interesting way to see yourself and read and look and do. But let's get back to Marshall McLuhan and extensions and amputations. This paper I talked about, I talk about, and it's here, we're going to be launching it in the, the end of March. What we found in this paper is we called it the Marsha moment. And why do we call it the Marsha moment? Well, let me get to that in a second. But did you know Marsha McLuhan had four teenage children and it drove him crazy that they listened to the radio and did their homework at the same time? drove him insane. A man that could read 10,000 words a minute couldn't believe that people could double task. Look at what we're doing now. Look at how many screens we're looking at now. Well, when you have that screen in front of you, how hard it is to pull your head away and actually talk and listen to someone. When we type, we hold our breath. Try it next time. When we talk, we exhale. What I found in my research and what was most amazing is that Gen X, my generation, that is the smallest generation in the workforce today, we're basically screwed all the time, is having its Marsha moment. Now, this, some of you will not remember, was a show called The Brady Bunch. And in The Brady Bunch, there were six kids. All of them were perfect. All of them were pretty. Well, to different levels of pretty, I guess that's the whole point of this story. And Jan talked, she was the middle daughter. And she came home one day and she screams, Marsha, 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 no one notices me, no one listens to me, no one pays attention to me. And that's what we're doing in the workplace. We're not listening, we're not paying attention, we're not doing anything. But what's happening while we're doing that is our economy and our leadership is moving on. We have now moved from a knowledge economy to a sharing economy and now we're moving to a visual economy. Leaders have to focus, leaders used to focus on task because that's how boomers and Gen X process information. We're now moving to a develop or a people-based, people-based resource-centered workplace. The last time this happened, they made a movie about it. It's called, I think it's called The Imitation Game. It's when they broke the code. And there's this great scene where the head guy comes in and he's going to rip apart the computer and he hates the computer that this brilliant man has created because he knows something new is coming. Has anybody else seen this movie or am I talking? Okay, good, because I thought it was a really good movie. And this is one of the reasons why. And he comes in and all the people who hated this man stood up for him and said, you know what? He's right, we need to change, we need this computer, and that's where we're going to. We're moving from a manage me to a develop me culture at work. It means we're not gonna have long PowerPoint presentations. It means we're actually gonna have conversation based. Because guess what, if you have just a skill, like accounting or you're doing tort work as a lawyer, you're gonna be outsourced to India. They can take and they can do everything that is just basic skill based and outsource it. A monkey can use technology now. What a monkey can't do, a computer can't do, and with all due respect to Professor Parity who's here, even AI at U of T haven't been able to develop the skill of relationships. Harvard Business School takes four out of every 10 applicants that come its way into the MBA program. Berkeley's Master of Fine Arts program is now only taking two candidates because the need to think logically, responsibly, and be able to articulate is so high that people are going for an MFA before they go for an MBA. Now just think about that for a little while. It means that you need to think. To think, what do you need? You need the opportunity to be developed. To be developed, what do you need? You need the opportunity to talk to another person. You need to be listened to. And think about the last time you felt listened to. What happened to you? OK, class participation part. What happened? You were engaged. You were engaged. And we just talked about 70% of the workforce is not engaged. And actually, it's 52% of the workforce that's actually disengaged in the United States. And my research was done in the United States and in Canada. And do you know what they say? No one's listening to me. 
So we developed a program. It's now available at York University, and we tested it. And I thought, this would be super fun. Let's see what happens. And I created, based on this and a series of other laminated cards, because I love my laminated cards, how to speak to another generation. And it's all based on learning, generational learning EQ, generational logic, and generational listening. And we wanted to understand if this would help people and how it would help people. Because I am focused so much on Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker is this brilliant man who was the first modern sort of organizational theorist. And I love Edward Deming, who was the father of modern productivity. Deming was so smart. He said that machines will only help people if people understand how to control machines. I always thought that was very interesting, even though Deming only wrote two academic papers. So we decided we designed this program and we test it. And we wanted to know one thing. If we taught you how to be listened to, would you listen? And would it reduce your stress? Well, I created a word cloud for today. And what it does is it takes all the data, because I believe in collecting data both in quantitative and qualitative format, which means we use surveys. We use a 19-question 19 19 survey, 7-point Likert scale. And then we collected data weekly in focus groups. And people from across the country sat down and talked about themselves. They put it in. And we asked them to journal every week as they were going through this course. And I told them what I was doing. And here's the interesting thing. As soon as they learned how to be heard by someone else, here are the key words. I, so I got something. I started to get feedback. And I started to feel better. My work week became easier. Now let's think about that. Once we start teaching people soft skills, for those of you who have been around, we don't focus on soft skills anymore. We say, OK, our disruption is focus on the soft skills. The hard skills are going to be outsourced. Take the time to talk to each other, start to give feedback, learn how we give feedback, and you'll have a better work week. And here are the net net results. 34% less stress at work. 34% less stress at work. One hour extra a week. And that accumulated as time went on because you weren't anymore playing email hot potato. Remember that? You just pass on the, the, the hot potato in the middle of the night. You're like, oh, yeah, I can't deal with it. But I know so-and-so will deal with it. And you started to make more money because you weren't having any more quick and inaccurate messaging. You weren't repeating yourself. You were actually focusing on your work and on your job. And you know what the other interesting thing is, which is my next area of study in 2018? How it affected people's families. People were able to talk to their parents about money, about death, about wills. Millennials were able to say to their parents, you know what, I didn't really want to go to university. I'd really like to explore being, being an entrepreneur. I'd like to do this. I'd like to do that. My own daughter has said to me, I, I don't think I'm going to go to university. I think I'm going to dance for a year. Oh. OK. Take work, feel better. Remember this chart? So yeah, great. But all of this to say, take the time. Learn how the generations are processing information, because all anybody will tell you is, oh, they have to do it my way. They're going to do it my way. No, they're not. That's why we're not innovating, as I talked about earlier. That's why we're 70% disengaged. That's why we're not productive. We're not communicating. Besides sex, communication is the sexiest thing we can have with each other. Like, really and truly, I'm not even kidding right now. Sometimes just talking to somebody is a little sexy. But you've got to do it well and enjoy it. And, this, and the generations, when we've got four generations in the workplace, we've never had that before, ever. And pretty soon we're going to have five. So if you want to earn more money, be a little more relaxed, have some more time, take the handy-dandy laminated chart. <laughs>